What's up, everybody? Welcome to Gojo and Golick. Mike Golick Jr., Mike Golick Sr., Claudia Bellafato holding it down at the DraftKings Studios in Boston. We got a great show for you guys today. Make sure you download, subscribe, rate, review, leave us a five star rating, and check us out here live Monday through Friday from 8 to 10 a.m. Eastern on the DraftKings Network, our YouTube channel, Samsung TV Plus, and more. Catch the best of Gojo and Golick every hour from noon to 1 Eastern. I see for one hour from noon to 1 p.m. Eastern, wherever you hear VEASAN on the radio Monday through Friday. Fun one coming up today off the first round of March Madness. Claudia, what do we got on the on deck here? Yes, lots to go over. Good Friday show for you. We're starting with Caitlin Clark in the madness. Tarika Foster Brasby helps break down the NCAA in the women's tournament. Oakland busts everybody's bracket. Head coach Greg Camp joins ah. the show. Mm, yeah, we'll talk about that. And senior versus the internet. Golic Senior meets the internet's latest trends, which we got into a little bit yesterday after the show. Very curious to see where that ends up. But we do have to talk about the upset. And if you were watching yesterday or followed us, on Twitter at Gojo and Golik, you saw that I had Kentucky going all the way. Okay, mm -hmm. but I also ah. said, guys, this is why betting is better than brackets because I was going to throw my bracket out anyway. I'd rather do it on day one. That's how I've come to terms with this. I would have rather seen Jack Golke go off, have a great game. Sure, take it, Oakland. I don't care because I made money yesterday on other bets. My bracket is in the trash, but that's quite all right with me. The wow. amount of wow. cope that's going on here right wow. now from Claudia is peak March Madness. This is what happens. You've got to justify it any way you can, Dad. This is like my golf game where I, I said the other day, I am not put enough effort into it to be able to justify getting mad at doing bad, but it is impossible to avoid on a day like yesterday. Overall, that I think started off with a bit of a slow burn. Coming out of the gates, I was like, man, does March Madness still have the same juice? And then 311 over six seed upsets later, and a couple of very shining moments. Like, Dad, what what happened yesterday with this Oakland team upsetting Kentucky and the ensuing results is the kind of stuff that you can already script into the one shining moment billing after the fact. And it gave us a new hero in Jack Golke, the young man who looks like he's damn near my age, who jacked up and made 10 threes in this game and now gets to etch his name in the history books. And as Claudia said, we get to talk to his coach, Greg Campy, coming up here in about 20 minutes, which is going to be very exciting. Listen, this, this is what this tournament is all about. This is what makes not only this tournament, but really this weekend, and it a lot of times starts with day one like it did, what makes it so good. And then hearing people like Claudia try and make excuses for why they don't care that their <laughs> sheet you know, got absolutely <laughs> torched by a 14 seed, not only losing a big game, but their eventual champion – uh, to say, oh, I don't care, when we know deep down she really does care. Oh, no, uh, I don't, Senior. <laughs> but I also don't have 10 other okay. brackets like you. So, you know, mm -hmm. I, I stuck to one. That's what I did. <laughs> Here's the, I, I don't and I won't apologize for it one bit. The The amazing thing is, is that we'll get to our pool that we have, the Gojo and Golik pool, and the pools all around the country. Of those that are 16, that went 16 and 0 yesterday, all those people called this. Uh, that's what bl blows my mind is how many people called the Oakland Kentucky upset. But, you know, we know what happens every year. We're now at since 85 when we went to the 64 team. Uh, it's 1985. We went to the 64 team uh, the tournament we have now. It's now the 23rd time a 14 seed is won. And, 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 Mike, they didn't just win. They never trailed with 14 and a no. half minutes to go. They held the lead on Kentucky, on a Kentucky team that has been horrible as of late, one and four in their last five uh, tournament games. But this used to be the entire freshman class Calipari would bring in, would all end up in the NBA. They're loaded with freshmen on their team again, which is making him reassess how he's going to build a team, which we can get into, uh, to, the, to the difference of how Oakland you know, has their team of basically you know, 40-year-olds and guys that are staying in college forever, and good for them, stay in college forever, all led by Jack Golke. This and everyone is gonna, this name is going to be said everywhere today, and everybody is going to go who Jack Golke hit ten threes in this game. Mike, you you threw out the stat yesterday of his threes attempts. This is one of the most I'll let you say it one of the most unbelievable stats I've ever heard in my life. 
Yes, Jack Golke, who was a Division II transfer into Oakland that ended up winning the Sixth Man of the Year award in the Horizon League this season, is a man who is known for jacking up threes. And how much, you ask? Well, this season, he attempted 335 field goals. Eight of them were from two-point range. Eight <laughs> attempts on the entire year from two-point range. In this game, he took no twos. Every shot that he took None. was a three-point shot. And as I was sitting around here and not familiar with Oakland basketball watching the end of this game, Claudia, I'm watching them basically just hunt him on the three-point line. They're running him off screens. They're running him out down the baseline trying to get him open there. And I'm like, man, it seems like they're always settling for threes for this guy, not realizing that he was born in the darkness and molded by it. And this man only lives by the three and dies by it. And so it's... It's hard to say it's the old Navy SEAL saying is you don't rise to the occasion. You fall to your training. This is the second game this season. This guy's attempted 20 threes. He's attempted 15 or more threes in six different games this year. So he's not new to this. He's true to this. No, and their coach said, too, in an interview, which you guys can ask about, they had a set amount of plays, and the majority of them were going to him. And everybody said Kentucky's defense was going to be their downfall. Kentucky actually had an okay game. But it just goes to show how good Oakland actually stepped up. So I'm upset, but like I, I, I said, I'm very happy for them. It was exciting to watch. I, it's, it, 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 is, it is why this tournament is the best. But, but I can't get over that stat. 335 Crazy. shots, 327 were from three-point range. Absolutely amazing. 20 attempts for him last night. He hits 10 of them. Um, as I mentioned, they never trail with, with 14 and a half to go. And for listen, for Kentucky in 22, they lost to a 15 seed. I mean, they were at one point going into uh, 2022, they were 19 and 0 against 14 seeds or higher, which really isn't too shocking. But now they've lost the last couple to a 14, a 15 seed oh. and now a 14 seed. So that that's troubling times for Calipari and Kentucky uh, when you get to the postseason. I went absolutely sicko mode last night and decided in the wake of the post game of this to mute the rest of college basketball that I was watching on TV and just listen to Matt Jones and Kentucky sports radio and the callers flooding in right now on nights like that caller radio is our nation's premier art form because this was a collection <laughs> yes. of the most devastated human beings on planet earth. I heard one guy say, and this was such a stray caught for the, uh, for Indiana university. But one guy said, we're on the verge of becoming IU was the most broken thing that I heard a person say <laughs> on Kentucky Sports Radio. But, Dad, everyone wants to fire Cal right now. This has been a relationship between fans and coaches that's been frayed for a while. You mentioned their last four NCAA tournaments have included missing the tournament, losing in the first round, losing in the second round, and losing in the first round, all doing it as near the top seeds in the bracket. And all while, Dad, you look and go back according to 24-7 Sports, 2020, number one recruiting class 2021 number two recruiting class 2022 right. number five recruiting class this last year number one recruiting class full of guys that went out here and rewrote the record books from three point land in Kentucky in a way that's probably not going to be the same next year and sitting at the helm of all of this dad is the interesting part because in college football this would sound like nothing but in college basketball John Calipari's got a 33 million dollar buyout and so there's most people looking around going all right we probably got booster boosters because this is Kentucky basketball Ball, but are they willing to cut this kind of check to tell this guy to kick rocks when he's been able to consistently bring in these high-level recruits, but now for the last handful of years, it has not materialized yeah. into anything but heartbreak for them? Well, we, you know, we, we've talked about how veteran leadership can help a team in the tournament, and you look at Oakland, which now they're going to play North Carolina State, which we'll get into at some point, so <laughs> we're guaranteed a double-digit seed going to the Sweet 16 uh, uh, or, or yeah, yeah, the Sweet Sixteen because of that. Yep. And also the the team makeup. We know what Calipari's makeup has been. You look at Oakland; they had one freshman, two redshirt freshmen, and all the rest are like forty year olds. Where Kentucky, uh, of their fifteen players, eight are freshmen, three are sophomores. So fourteen of the fifteen are in year one or two. So it, it really is. I we, I've heard I heard Calipari after the game talking about is he going to have to try, try and rearrange or change how he builds a program now since this way as of late isn't working. 
Yeah, it's going to be it's sort of amazing to see what reckoning comes of there because, again, if you were just buying into what the fan base wanted, they'd have had this guy fired 15 minutes ago, but that's nothing new. It's just at a place like Kentucky that is one of the basketball blue bloods, and for a coach like John Calipari, who has defined an era, he's been there since 2009, and he's brought them a championship. He's brought them a ton of Final Four experience, appearances and draft picks, but, yeah, in the changing world of college, and we'll see, you know, the G League Ignite going away, does that do anything on the top? And for some of this, or are right. we just living in a world now where there's so much volatility that that senior laden nature of a roster becomes more important than ever? I I'm sure we'll get more and more on that as it goes along. I, I don't know in this situation with that price tag, I don't know how he actually gets fired, and I don't know how you make this work yeah. any differently. Yeah. If John Calipari really is able to change his stripes, that would be a monumental stride forward because they've always got that kind of high end talent coming in. Um, Dad, the other thing that I think stuck out this last night and Claudia Oof. was the Kansas and Samford game, a game that oh. I had written off early on, and all of a sudden you look up after the Oakland celebration and you see Samford's pulled this thing to within single digits of a lead, and it all comes down to the almost block heard around the world at the end of this game. One of the most egregious calls I'd imagine we will yeah. see in this as Sanford is in the middle of mounting a comeback. They're in the final minutes of this game, and Kansas catches a steal and is on a fast break, and A.J. Stanton McRae runs down in the open court and gets a clean block. Everyone's going to see this picture today if you're not watching on DraftKings Network right now. Clear as day, blocked by James Energy from behind, Dad, and the referees blow the whistle, I think expecting the foul. That seems clear as day to me. That yes, they yes, expected there yes. to be a foul on this play because of how yep. far the chase down was coming from, and it completely robbed Samford of their chance at glory in this game in a way that is inexcusably bad. Oh, it, it was... It, this was a horrible call that should have been a non-call, but I think everybody can understand at fast pace why it was a call because Samford had to foul. Samford had to try and not let that bucket happen. And the kid, Nicholas Timberlake, went up for a, the slam, which is exactly what he should do. And you force the defense, the opposing team, to have to foul you. So the natural assumption was going to be he's going to foul him. So the whistle goes quick right away. Timberlake makes his free throws. And now it's back to a three-point lead where if it's the other way, if it's called correctly, and there's no doubt it was called incorrectly, you have to understand moving it forward, let's not just stop at that should have been a non-call. That means if it was a non-call, continue on with the play. Timberlake face plants on the, on the ground, so he's down. Yeah. Sanford has numbers the other way. Sanford has numbers the other way and could take the lead with about, what, 14 seconds to go or, or right in that area there. Uh, they, they could have they, That could have been it. They could have taken the lead and won this game because they would have had numbers coming the other way, and uh, it's a shame. It's a shame. And Timberlake doing exactly what he should do, saying, yes, I was fouled. A.J. Stanton McRae, who, who did the phantom foul, said, yeah, I, what, what he said, if it was Casper, the ghost, which was a great line, by the way. Um, it was, I, I, I think we all understand they were going to blow the whistle because it was close in proximity and everybody felt Sanford had to try and stop the bucket and it was going to be a slam dunk. Uh, so I, I, I can almost understand it, yet I can say almost understand it, but be so ticked to know, man, what a clean block that was and should have just gone the other way. I just think that's the reason why officials are always coached to, when in doubt, be late with the whistle. Take an extra second. Like, I've been around enough officiating to know that that's something in every sport that's coached into you to try and avoid situations like this. And I think the added level of frustration is how many in-game reviews we saw at the end of that game or others to look yep. over minor things like who was, you know, if it was going off out of bounds off somebody's hands. And now you get into the final two minutes, you know, final minute of this game with a play that decided the game. Like the game was basically over yeah. after this play happened. And you could do nothing in reviewing this, something that should have been clear and obvious to everyone in there if there was ever an ability to overturn. And instead, we get this like dad I, I can't let the officials off the hook and, and like I want to make it clear like no that doesn't mean do weirdo stuff like say you know send right, death threats right, to right, these right, officials right. or find anything like that like god I hope we can still draw the distinction between holding accountable the third team on the court 
This is what we do all the time with athletes and coaches. We hold them accountable for the egregious mistakes that they make that influence the outcome of the game. And this officiating crew robbed these young men of their moment. I don't think there's any two ways about that. It can be somewhat understandable, but that's why you're supposed to let... And I get it. It's a big moment, all that stuff. It's the same big moments that these players are a part of and the same big moments we expect these players and coaches to go out there and play and coach their asses off. And so I have no problem laying into officiating when they're also on the wrong end of those moments. Yeah, this was an absolute assumption that it was going to be a foul and was absolutely wrong. And Bucky McKillen, the coach at Sanford, handled it with a lot of class. He said, I thought A.J. made an incredible play. He said, I'm not faulting the call. You can see it different ways, but I was really proud of our guy's ability to go make a play. So, I mean, it would have been hard to hold my tongue, man. (laughs) I mean, after something like that, uh, just such an egregious call. Yeah, absolutely brutal call there. So Kansas continues to move on there. Tough one for Samford. You certainly feel for them a great moment that I'm sure will get talked about there a lot. But unfortunately now in the tournament, as someone who was on the you know second place end of a championship event, they don't do a lot of reunions for the second place team or the team no. that almost pulled <laughs> off the upset. So like I said, in that vein, we'll talk to Oakland head coach Greg Campy coming up here in about 15 minutes, Dad. You also mentioned, by the way, the fact that we are going to have that double-digit matchup. I believe it's the 11-14 matchup involving NC State there. And I saw our buddy, the Bear, Chris Felica, tweet yesterday that I believe in the tournament's history, 11 seeds are 6-0 and in the matchups with 14 seeds in this round. So something to keep in mind as our thick king, DJ Burns, continues to yep. become the star of the show, watching NC State go out and beat Texas Tech Dad to the tune of all the cheers every time DJ Burns, the six nine listed 275 pounds i will say that's probably a little bit generous but listed 275 pound mountain of a man who is one of the stars and the mvp of the acc tournament just backing dudes down on the block listening to the crowd light up every single time he touched the ball it's a great moment for large excellence dad there's no two ways about it it made my fat heart sing dude had played 16 minutes he was in foul trouble played just 16 minutes had 16 points And in this day and age of basketball and big plays, you hear people cheer for three-pointers or for these crazy dunks. It was amazing. Every time the ball got, you know, thrown into him, the crowd started going nuts. All they wanted to see him was back down. This was old school. This was old school fives, if you you will, even though nobody's listed as a five anymore. They're forwards. Back somebody down into the paint and throw up that left-handed hook or, or just, he, he, they'd throw it to him, he'd kick it out, they'd throw it back in, people would start cheering, he'd kick it out, they'd stop, they'd throw it back in, they'd cheer again, he'd hit a hook, people would go nuts. He is just fun to watch. But for this team, again, he played just 16 minutes. A uh, guy came in uh, uh, spelling him at a game 21 points, what, Ben Middlebrooks did a great job, and they move on. And I, I would think they're going to move on yet again and be in the Sweet 16. And I had them. I bet on them. So I was more happy to see NC State than Kentucky leave it. Just, uh, just saying. Just saying. You know just going back. Uh, Long, Claudia, Beach, well, Long Beach State, uh, too, covered by the hook, the 20 and a half. So uh, people who got the 20 didn't cover, but I got the hook, so I covered. So just saying, betting over brackets. Go ahead, Gojo. Claudia mainlining wow. copium today through the form of yes. the DraftKings Sportsbook tabs here. <laughs> so, yes, congratulations to all involved there, including our large adult son, DJ Burns, who, again, I will maintain, DJ, one year with the Brahmas in the USFL or the XFL, whatever it is now, and then let's get my man ready to play tackle in the NFL. That man looks like a blindside protector, looks like a road grader. If we can just tighten up the hands, he's already got the feet, and we've got a star in the making here. Upon this rock, I will build my church. Coming up, I want to get to the most outlandish statement from the NCAA tournament yesterday, courtesy yes. of Long Beach State that Claudia just brought up there. We also will take some time to take a look ahead at not only our brackets, the beat the Gojo and Golik bracket pool on the DraftKings Sportsbook right now, the dad cleaned up a little bit in yesterday. We got a couple of people tied for the lead in that one, but we have also delayed it long enough. We've got to get the updates of a hotly debated Starch Madness bracket from yesterday and preview the bracket that's coming up today. We finished up with desserts yesterday, not without much controversy. And now we get to look ahead at the final section of our bracket, the drinks, coming up next here on Gojo and Golik.
enter the Beat the Golix bracket on DraftKings. It's time to look over day one to see how you matched up with the Golix themselves. So guys, tell me, we talked a little bit off the top, Senior, you're bragging and, and hating on my bracket, that's fine, but, but tell us a recap of yours first and then we'll go to Gojo. Well, mine's, mine's very easy. I only had two losses, so I had oh, a great okay. day. And I, and I, I should have been 50 and one. But c congrats to the Flyers. The Dayton comeback on Nevada. Man, I, th I thought Nevada had that one. Dayton comes back and gets the win. That was my one loss. The other was Kentucky. Uh, obviously, I think most people had Kentucky. Um, so I am, we had over 36,000 entries, and we appreciate everybody jumping in the Gojo and Golic bracket challenge there. Uh, and we had, we had two people out of that with perfect brackets right now. Booyah D uh, and it was a Trey Barrett 88 are both perfect. Uh, Booyah D has Houston winning it all. Trey Barrett has North Carolina winning it all. I'm out of those 36,000, Mike, or 36,000 plus, I'm 104th. So those two are perfect. The next bunch are at 15-0, and 0, and I'm sure most of those one losses are Kentucky of who won 15-0, and 0, and then the 14-2 and 2 group. But I'm in 104th. I am easily winning of our whole group here, no doubt about it. How horrible were you? Were you horrible yesterday, or were you, were you okay? <laughs> No, twelve and four yesterday, so fine and survive in advance, man. If you, if you want to go ahead and start to celebrate the victory after round one, be yeah. my guest. I will yeah. enjoy watching your demise yeah. as the tournament goes along because it ain't how, to, how you start; it's how you finish. Right now, my meteoric rise from four thousand and thirty second place will be the subject of later oh. thirty for thirties and various documentaries. So, don't listen. No, it's fine. Honestly, get all your gloating out now because the king You're of bad takes that come back to bite you, the old takes exposed master himself, Mike Golick Senior. I will happily have our crew clip this out for when you eventually come crumbling back down to earth. It's going to bring me a ton of joy. The, the biggest change now is what we used to say is light your bracket sheet on fire. But now I would just say, delete your bracket sheet. That's the difference of today, right? Uh, Cause I, I, this whole weird out thing of doing it. I, I, I still, still have my paper. I have my paper. Of course he, of course he does. Figure it out here. My dad, murderer, murderer of trees, destroyer of paper everywhere, refusing to go, <laughs> come into the digital age. But I, I mean, it's still, it's going to be the day. I don't know if yesterday was quite it because I, I think a fair amount of people might have had that Kentucky upset. But even not, it's still only one day for people that had it as their champion. Like right. Claudia, you're screwed. But I didn't see all of the dumpster yep. fire emojis make their way to the timeline yet, and that's no. usually when everyone has just fully given up on this as right. a collective. And so I don't think we're quite there yet but we're getting closer by the day so thank you to everybody that entered that on the DraftKings Sportsbook by the way thank you also to everyone that has helped us vote on Starch Madness as Claudia mentioned before we have had our show bracket full of delicious items as we've tried to pick out from a 32 team field the best fast food item in America nay in the world and yesterday Yesterday, it got contentious on here, Dad. You and I went to blows over the DQ Blizzard versus the uh, yep. Subway Cookie. You got a little more support than I imagined from the people on the Subway Cookie, a cherished member of the, like people's childhood nostalgia, I think. Uh, unfortunately, it fell on the chopping block here. The resulting the vo voting results for dessert are as follows. The three-seed DQ Blizzard defeated the six-seed Hershey Sunday Pie, and by a margin that was disrespectful. The Hershey Sunday Pie yeah, didn't deserve that. That was ridiculous. Yep. Agreed. We had yep. the Cold Agreed. Wars Concrete uh, I mean, Mixer I've... as the five-seed yep. beating the four-seed Cookout Shake. We had the number one Wendy's Frosty dominating the Taco Bell Cinnamon Delights, and the McFlurry, as we mentioned, taking down the Subway Cookie. But, Dad, I have to say your opinion was vindicated by a lot of people on the timeline who also took up for the Subway Cookie. Yeah, big, I'm a big-time Subway Cookie fan. Again, I voted for that. Uh, while there are blizzards and McFlurries and concrete mixers, there's just something about a good old-fashioned chocolate chip cookie, you know, that whets the appetite. And uh, it went down to defeat, but uh, but I, I, I thought it got should have got a little more respect than that. I'll still take a couple of cookies and a glass of milk. 
a glass are you getting a glass of milk from subway though like are you the no. person that's ordering the carton of milk there no what i'll do is i'll order me a couple of cookies Worried. i'll bring them home and then before bedtime i'll warm up my milk and have some nice warm milk and warm chocolate chip cookies eat that drink that and then go to bed the funniest part is, Claudia, the lie told here isn't Stop that my dad me, would be drinking Claudia. warm milk before bed. It's that those cookies have a chance of even making it out of the store, let alone the car ride home before being eaten. That's the biggest lie told. We all know that's how it works. I just got to say, Senior, that was like so cute with your little paper bracket and your warm milk and your cookies going to bed. Come on, Gojo. Isn't that cute of your dad? <laughs> you know what? You know what, Claudia? I see through you. You're mocking me because I've given you a hard time about your Good. sheet being destroyed and you not caring. And I've, 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 that was a, that was a kind of underlying, you know, rip on me. Let's no. get you to bed, Grandpa. It's endearing, I swear. You're my show dad. Say, it's cute. The funny part is Claudia was being nice, but you're just so used to me soaked in venom over here and me and my siblings <laughs> making fun of you for being old yeah. that you immediately That's got true. your guards up ready to go here. Yeah. Uh, let's get our guards up for the final section of Starch Madness that we've got to vote on, and it's the drinks. And this one, as we open voting today, this was probably one of the most difficult to fill out and seed. Um, we wound up, guys, with... This one right now, they'd be the first two matchups, this one near and dear to our heart. The one seed, Taco Bell Baja Blast versus the eight seed Baskin Robbins Freeze right now. And anyone, longtime listeners of the show, knows and understands that our dear friend Jesse Cofield, who right now is on maternity leave, having given birth to a beautiful baby boy, has, as we've fondly, affectionately dubbed it, Baja Blast that baby out into the sun. So that one going up against the Baskin Robbins freeze, pretty easy. The two seed Mount McDonald's yep. Fountain Diet Coke versus the seven seed Duncan Culotta. I wanted to include the Duncan Ice Coffee, the Culotta specialty menu item that we let go here. And uh, dad, the McDonald's Di Fi Fountain Diet Coke, an absolute juggernaut in the tournament. This is another thing, Claudia, of simplicity. Like the chocolate cookie at Subway, the McDonald's fountain drink, and for, for me, and anytime I'm out somewhere and I'm coming home, I'll, I'll text Mike, your mother, and say, do you need anything? She said, you know, love a Diet Coke, and it's a Diet Coke from McDonald's. There's just something about the McDonald's Diet Coke. It, it's, just, it's just like an old friend. You know, it's just Diet Coke is Diet Coke in a lot of places, but it just hits different with McDonald's. So it's simple, but I think powerful. I'm going to get, I think I've already struck out, but here's another strike for me. I've actually never oh drank boy. Coke or Pepsi. Okay. I just think Ever? it's gross. I, I had like a sip of you it when I was younger. It? And I, a sip of it when I, like 12 years ago, and I thought it was disgusting. And I've never had it ever since. I'm a For anyone that's Sprite not girl. watching on the DraftKings Network, my father has walked off in protest <laughs> right now. He's disgusted. Claudia approached Coca Cola. And Coke products, the way that I approached, like, I remember being a kid watching my dad and his friends sitting around drinking, um, uh, it was like Mad Dog, or it wasn't Mad Dog, it was some kind of beer when I was a kid, and I walked by and I was like, oh, dad, I want to try a sip, and he, of course, gave me a sip knowing I would hate it. I spit it out and avoided beer for a while and eventually made my way back to the fold. Claudia's treated yeah. Diet Coke like that, one of the sweetest elixirs of hangover-destroying life Ooh. on earth, and especially, dad, you brought up the Fountain Diet Coke from McDonald's hits different. Different than the glass bottle, different than the can, different than anything else. And when you're a hungover college kid on a Sunday morning looking for salvation, the Fountain Diet Coke has been our mana from heaven. It has been Valhalla. <laughs> it's, it is, when whether you're hungover or whether you need a drink, and what you do is you get that straw in there and you just go after it. And you just start <laughs> drinking as much as you can Claudia, until your eyes start to water, that the carbonation hits so hard going down your throat that your eyes start to water, that's when you know you've gotten enough and you've gotten that first great sip of Diet Coke. Senior, your passion is it's unmatched, been... man. <laughs> the passion is undeniable. That's what this month is all about, is that passion. So at Gojo and Golik on Twitter is where you can start the voting for that. We'll give you the other two matchups later in the show as we move along and get going through a very, very busy Friday in the middle of March Madness. But coming up next, as we look back and recap the day that was here, we will talk to the star of March Madness in the early going here. Oakland's head coach Greg Campy joins us next here on Gojo and Golik.
Mike Gojo and Golik, and very exciting morning for us here as we are basking in the Globe, one of the best upsets in tournament history as Oakland ticks down the number three seed, Kentucky. We are delighted now to be joined by Oakland University's head men's basketball coach, Greg Campy, here with us now. And Coach was sitting in the chat listening to us debate fountain sodas in the last segment here, and Coach came <laughs> up in defense of Diet Dr. Pepper, of all things. Good morning. Hey, good morning. It's the best. I mean, I bet you people will tweet into you that it is the best. It, it is. Listen, it, I I completely agree. I just where where when I was in the Midwest, I just didn't see it enough. But I think it's it's getting up there more and more. It's been more in the South, but it's a great drink along with Diet Coke. Uh, so I'm glad you got that. I like my Diet Coke, and every Oakland fan and alumni loved what you guys did uh, last night to, to Kentucky. So take us through this. Take, take us through the emotion of this game. Well, I got myself in a little trouble before the game because uh, Big Blue Nation got mad at me because I said this was the game we wanted. And what they didn't understand was I was complimenting them. We wanted to play the best. Prime time seven o'clock CBS. Why wouldn't an Oakland want that? You know, I mean, no matter when you're the 14th seed, no matter who you play, you're going to be the underdog. So why wouldn't you want to play the best in front of everybody? So the world could see us. And I knew we had a really good team and I knew we had a chance to win. And, and I just wanted that. And uh, once the game got going, I think we proved we belong. And uh, you know, we didn't blow many teams out this year. We just won a lot of, we've won 18 of our last 21 and most of them have been overtimes and last minute games. And no matter who we played, we just were found a way to win. And I, I thought if we could get into the last four minutes last night, the pressure would be on them and we could win. Yeah, coach, I saw you saying in the broadcast, your message to the team was we win close games. And that was the message throughout the game. What was the moment like after with this team finally getting to a moment that you've been chasing for 40 years here at Oakland? Yeah. And, you know, we've won a lot of power five games in that, but we've never won one the magnitude of that. We beat Tennessee once when they were in the top five in the country or something and in and, and that, but we not the magnitude. I mean, obviously that game changed lives and it, it will change those kids' lives forever. I mean, it, they'll always be known as this group of kids. Now they'll be brought back every five or 10 years to Oakland. They'll, the shot DQ Cole made in the corners, probably the biggest shot in Oakland history. Uh, you know, the, the Golki kid is now legendary. I mean, the greatest part of the whole thing was after, after all the interviews, good morning, America, all that kind of stuff. We get back to the hotel and we're having our team meal and the players were just killing Golki because uh, social media was, was, you know, just, uh, on fire with Kentucky off uh, all their pros just got beat by a guy that's going to be selling insurance next year or, or oh. leave the used car oh. salesman. He, or he, oh, I don't, no. I've never seen Seinfeld, but I guess he looks like some character that was on there and they were, you know, they were calling him that guy's name and, and they were killing him in the, in, during the dinner. And it was so much fun just sitting there watching these kids just enjoying and laughing. I guess they're young. Coach, men we had now. mentioned. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we we had mentioned he had taken uh, coming into this. I believe three three hundred and thirty five shots. Three hundred and twenty seven of those were threes. How many of those were the old the the classic uh, yelling from the coach at the sideline? No, no, no. Yes, that he's taking a three. You can't believe he's taking and that he, that he makes one. I mean, it seems like he always has the green light. Yeah, not one of them because that's been my history. I I always try and have a guy like that because it, it just screws up the defense when you have a guy, even if they're bad shots, you know, now, I mean, if you can't make any, then then it's not good. But <laughs> I've had Tra Travis Bader before him was the all-time three-point shooter king in the history of college basketball at one point. And so, you know, we've lived off that, won a lot of games with that, and that's what we recruited him for. And he actually earlier in the year – uh, he went through a slump like all shooters do. And I was yelling at him. I told him, I'm going to take you out of the line. I'm not going to play you if you won't shoot, you know, just because you don't think you can make it right now. Just keep shooting, you know, and boy, he, he does. I mean, he takes a lot of bad shots, but, but uh, they go in. I mean, he took a couple last night were, were just crazy and nothing but that. And uh, that, that makes Trey Townsend, who was the MVP of our conference, that just makes him better because you can't double him. You can't, you know, Trace down there by himself. 
Yeah, I think everyone for everyone catching up, Jack Golke, the sixth man of the year in the Horizon League this year. And you mentioned shooting through that. Where does he get that confidence from as you're recruiting this guy? Where did that jump out to you? Well, all shooters are kind of weird, all right? They they really are because you've got to have a, a unbelievable mentality, especially a kid that looks like him. I mean, he looks like he he plays Division three football, you know, or a wrestler or something, right? And, um, you know, we hide him in our defense because he's not exactly the greatest defender in the world. Um, but he rebounds. He does rebound. But he's a thick, strong kid with, you know, fullback calves, right? And so, you know, they're all weird. All the shooters are weird. And you just got to stay in their head and just, you know, you've got to, as a coach, let them know that you believe in them so that they never lose confidence because making shots is all in your mind. I mean, you've got to be good at it, but if, if you believe they'll go in and it's just like free throws, you know, we're a great free throw shooting team last night, but the pressure of that game got to us. I mean, we were 10 or 20 from the free throw line should have cost us the game. Uh, you know, I have a saying around here. There's two things in the world that don't last dogs that chase cars and teams that can't make free throws. And <laughs> somehow we, we survived last night, but, it is what it is, man. It, it's, it was unbelievable win. Just unbelievable. Very, very true line, by the way. So 40 years you've been there at Oakland. You get this monster win, but we know how this works, right? You got a game, you know, tomorrow. <laughs> so there's the celebration, and then there's preparing for North Carolina State. So where are you in that? Well, you know, we I was up all night. My staff's up all night. That's That's their job. That's our job. Uh, I let the players sleep in. We were supposed to, you know, originally we were going to get them up at 930, have breakfast, then have lunch again at noon. And, you know, you got to feed them. I mean, especially when you're coming back to backs like this, they got to eat properly. So we decided to let them sleep and we're going to have a big brunch at 11. And then at 1130, we'll start. Uh, they'll, they'll watch film. We'll have a walkthrough. We'll get over for practice at two. We won't we won't do much. We'll shoot. And we'll run up and down just to break us break a sweat a little bit. But we won't do much, but it will be all mental. You know, we put a game plan in and and I pay two Harvard graduates uh, a lot of money to get the analytics of uh, our opponents. And so I'll have a Zoom call with them in a little bit to go over all the analytics of North North Carolina State. What And then as we set our offensive game plan, what are they bad at? What are they good at? And then defensively, you know, what do we have to do? And, you know, just in my preliminary so we play zone, which not many teams do. So last night I had every clip of zone. They had 128 or so possessions against zone this year. I watched every clip of that. My staff watched every clip of it. And that's what we'll show them today. We'll show them what they do against zone and how we're going to guard it. Because the zone's kind of a goofy zone. It's really a man-to-man -man that looks like a zone. Uh, but, I mean, we got to trick people when you're Oakland. You know, you can't. If you just line up and play the Kentucky's a world head to head, you're going to get beat. So you got to have a little trickery in there. And, and another saying we have around here is the smart take from the strong, you know? So if we're smart, we can win. Uh, incredible words that obviously turned into an incredible upset that you're right. Everyone at, at Oakland, but certainly I, I think everyone around college basketball, you guys are what this tournament is all about and the best parts of it here. So coach, uh, I, I know every week when you do the coaches show at the pub that you're at, usually you said they made you pay for your dinner. You got free fries this week. I have to imagine you're done paying for food for life at that pub now, right? Well, I, if, if, so we won't have the show if we'd lose Saturday. You know, that was supposedly the last show. That's probably why they gave me the free fries and probably never thought we were going to beat Kentucky, right? So if we win Saturday, there'll be another show Monday. And I'm going to walk in there and I'm going to demand a full meal. All right. I'd give me a sub with it or something, right? <laughs> exactly. Well, Coach, oh, you have earned awesome. it and then some. Congratulations <laughs> on the win. Best of luck coming up here in the next round. I know we're all excited to watch you guys keep doing your thing. Well, thank you so much for having Oakland on your show. It, it's It's been a great week for us. We want to keep it going. Thanks, Absolutely, Coach. Appreciate yeah. it. Go I, enjoy I think we all want to see Pepper. you guys keep it going yeah. as well. So that's uh, yeah. the great Greg Campy, kind enough to join us here. And now 40 years at the helm of Oakland as the shepherd yeah. for this program. And mentioned some other tournament appearances, some other big wins, but none bigger than upsetting third seed Kentucky yesterday.
like Yoshinobu Yamamoto was basically the next biggest signing next to Shohei Otani in the offseason, both on the Dodgers squad. However, in his debut against the Padres, he got shelled, gave up five earned in one inning. So, of course, everybody goes to Twitter and is hating on this guy. First of all, he got the $325 million deal for a reason. Three consecutive Saimura Awards, Cy Young of the Japanese League, 1.72 career ERA in seven seasons, three straight MVPs. The dude can pitch. It was his first Major League Baseball game, so everybody... Take a deep breath, okay? And the stat going around of his ERA being 45, yeah, that's what happens when you give up five in one inning. So just everybody chill out. However, that's not the only bad news for the Dodgers because as we talked about yesterday, the Shohei Otani gambling saga continues. Some good news, though, that we got as of late. Shohei Otani is not under investigation by Major League Baseball. There is no strikes against him as of right now, and his reps did reach out to get an investigation going for a massive theft. So basically the update we have is that Shohei is not in trouble as of right now, and still it's being seen as a major theft. And that is the big news you know, Yamamoto, big news to me, but of course, Shohei is on everybody's <laughs> mind. Gojo. It's my, my favorite, my favorite part about all this is we're sitting here all like everyone in the national media is so excited because we've got this very juicy baseball story happening in a sport that usually doesn't give us a bunch of treetop headlines like this. And all Claudia was doing, she was frothing at the mouth in the break to come in defense of Yamamoto in this first outing here to make sure that this young man knew that somebody had his back and all this. Honestly, Claudia, very endearing that you would come out here and defend him is being by far the second most interesting Japanese player on the Dodgers roster right now he was so nervous before the game you could see it and then he's out here probably looking at social media like wow now everybody hates me no Yamamoto we love you still I'm so excited to see him crush it I cannot wait to see him go throw a gem in the next one <laughs> not gonna lie uh rarely do I see an ERA higher than a pitch count yet here we are yeah. I mean why are you giving that guy 43 pitches and a 45 ERA I mean Clearly, it was a waste of money, right, Claudia? I mean, how, you, how do you not make that determination in, oh, in I, uh, one inning? I, I, I see you're trying to fight today. I, I get it. Yeah, no. <laughs> Sorry, you know what? We know, we know somebody that'll bet on him again. Um, speaking of, yeah. so I thought it was interesting yesterday, Dad, that this comes out about Shohei Itani is we were all sitting here, and I think the initial reaction to this felt very big because it is, you know, three-letter government agencies looking into an illegal gambling book, and it's one of the biggest stars in baseball with his name, with money on a wire here, and this inconsistent story of a translator talking to ESPN about all the proceedings here as we're trying to wonder who is actually at fault in this, what's actually going on, and I, I gotta give credit, I was listening to Colin Cowherd yesterday talk about this, and it was kind of an interesting level set in thinking about what went on here and if it's actually worth as much attention as we're going to give it. Because the one line that got drawn pretty early on in this by his interpreter, and the thing that I would imagine is going to be the focal point of the focus going forward, is he didn't bet on baseball. That got said over and over right. is, we knew, <laughs> hey, we were in the meetings in the preseason. We know that if you are a member of the Major League base of Major League Baseball as a player or as a per member of league personnel, you can't bet on that and you can't bet with an illegal bookmaker. So on one hand, Dad, when I hear that, I go, all right, well, if you take them at their word right now, what did Shohei really do then? Sports gambling is legal most everywhere except for California and a few other holdover states. And this is a guy who, yeah, the number is staggering, but if Shohei or anyone in his camp, let's just say, if it was Shohei's interpreter truly with a gambling problem here, if he's gambling within his means on sports that aren't baseball – kind of just an adult doing his thing. Now, the real hang-up is going to be if we believe a guy who also knew the rule was you're not allowed to bet with an illegal bookmaker and did it anyway, that he right. also did not bet on Major League Baseball during that time period. That's where gonna, the rubber's going to meet the road because the rest of it now does seem like, all right, well, as sensational as the headline was going to be, it doesn't seem like it's going to net much blowback for Shohei unless it comes out that there is any connection to betting on Major League Baseball. Well, 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 here's where I'm going to disagree. It's kind of like the steroids in sports. You're responsible for what you put in your body. You know what? You're responsible for making a bet in, an, in, a, in a state where it's illegal to make a bet. 
So that's on you, you know? And, and listen, what, once we get past between marijuana being legal everywhere, gambling being legal everywhere, you're going to run into these situations. What happened here was illegal. We, and we can say it's ridiculous, right? Because eventually gambling is going to be legal everywhere. But at this point, much like if you put something in your body that you're not supposed to, that's your fault. You know what? You, you have to know it is illegal to gamble in California. And how quickly will Rob Manfred want to believe, oh, yeah, yeah, Shoei was just trying to bail this guy oh. out because you have wire transfers. You have wire transfers from Shoei's account for half a million dollars a couple of times going to a bookie where gambling is illegal. And the story is it's because his interpreter has a problem. You know Rob Manfred saying, yeah, 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 absolutely. Look at show. He's just a good guy trying to bail his guy out. He did nothing wrong. But it, I think it's ridiculous because gambling eventually is going to be illegal everywhere. But just like if a speed limit's 55 and you're going 70 and you get pulled over, it, that's on you. I'm not saying I agree well, with it all I, the time. And gambling no. will be illegal everywhere. This, this was wrong to do. And I get it, but it's wrong in terms of, oh, would there potentially be a punishment for his translator if he's found out here? Sure. Now, again, nothing is going to happen at this point based on what we've heard to Shohei Atani, who is not under investigation right. from Major League Baseball. But I guess in terms of like the way the headline felt at the beginning is a little bit of a holdover from a different era provided he didn't bet on baseball. Like, again, that's the thing that's sitting in the heart of this is the Pete Rose of it all, where everyone's hoping and praying yeah. that the biggest star in the sport has no connection to that, which, again, at this point, there is none. They have come out and denied that. There has been no evidence to the contrary as we have this stuff coming out. But that's really, in my mind, the only thing to keep an eye on at this point. Because, again, Dad, even if now, if you had made this in a state where it was legal and all of a sudden he was connected to this, he's allowed to bet on everything but baseball right. at this right. point, provided it was through Agreed. a legal book. And so I guess that's the thing where all of a sudden after that initial nerve end hit of oh man Shohei gambling all this stuff that feels very off-putting then you sit back and realize and go all right well actually the only thing that was against the rules has nothing to do with the integrity of the game portion of things and I think that's the one thing that we are all still trying to make sure gets protected as we've seen it in college sports seep into that and start to affect that yeah I, again I hate to be the old man here but it's it's whether you like the rule or not, it's a rule. It's just like in, in football, the guys that have gotten in trouble for gambling, remember, they were gambling on other sports as well, but they were doing it in their facility or in the team hotel, which is, sure. again, you can bet on different sports, but it's illegal to do in certain situations. No, I, I get that in, in terms of like pu the punishment portion. I'm just saying, Dad, like the scarlet letter that hangs around a guy like Pete Rose versus coming off of right. this situation, staying away Agreed. from betting yes. on the sport. Like that's the only thing yes. that really matters. Any sort of punishment here that, again, is not going to involve Shohei Itani at this point, to me is largely irrelevant when it comes to the headline now that you've avoided the worst possible outcome. I, I Listen, I agree with that. Not betting on, on the sport you're in. Now, it doesn't mean you can't get in trouble you know, with, with bookies, even if you get behind, you know, like, like his interpreter, you know, supposedly did here like four and a half million dollars. Imagine if that's a player getting behind by four and a half million dollars, even if he's betting on a different sport, all of a sudden someone trying to influence him to try and Claudia and try and make up that money. I'm just still caught up on the fact that it went from him sitting down at a computer show, hey, with a, his interpreter behind him doing yeah. all of this yeah. to a massive theft. H how did those two come together? And, and we still have no clarification on that. So that's the part that sticks out to me more than anything. Yeah, and I think that's the part that we'll see if anyone is now going to be willing to dig in. Now that Major League Baseball has come out and said, we're not investigating Shohei, we don't think he did anything wrong, is anyone going to go out there and do the work of continuing yeah. to pry into right. this situation and find out what really happened? Because if that all stinks right now from the outside looking in based on the timeline that we were given, then we have to look at every detail that's presented in the story somewhat incredulously until we find out true answers as to what actually has gone down here.
Ben Golick. If you enter the Beat the Golicks bracket, we're going to go over the guys' picks for this next round. And of course, we have our very own bracket going on. Some may say it's even more important. It's starch madness, baby. And we have some matchups to go over in the drinks region, Gojo. What's going on here? Yep, drinks region already underway. And we've got our last two matchups of the region here to dive into the three seed, Sonic Cherry Limeade versus the six seed Panera Lemonade. Very controversial bracket mm. portion here. Yes. The four seed in this bracket going up against the five seed. Four seed, Starbucks Iced Coffee versus the five seed, Popeye's Cane Iced Tea. Dad, variety, the spice of life in this portion of the bracket here. The Sonic Cherry Limeade, for me, was the subject of lore when I was a kid because we grew up in Connecticut and where we were in central Connecticut, there wasn't a Sonic anywhere really close to around us at right. that point. And so it took all the way until I got to college when in Notre Dame and South Bend, there's a Sonic right up near Grape Road downtown in Granger. And the first time I was able to get up there and get my mouth on some of the sweet Sonic cherry limeade, it was a game changer. And so this one's got a lot of nostalgia tied into it for me in a way that just doesn't exist for the Panera Lemonade. Yeah, the Panera Lemonade, I, I've had more than the Sonic Cherry Limeade, but I like the, uh, the Cherry Limeade more, better. So I'm, I'm going to vote for that, even though I've had it uh, not as much as the Panera Lemonade. The other one is an easy one for me. I, I don't drink, and I don't think I ever will drink iced coffee. Uh, so, and, and you know me, I'm all the way on the other side saying, if you go into a coffee place and order coffee and just say coffee that's assumed it should be hot, and not iced. You should be able to have to specifically ask for iced coffee. So I don't drink it. Cool for you guys to do. I know Mike, you do. Claudia, I don't know if you do or not. I'm, I'm going to assume your generation. You know, you do don't or you had it. Um, so I will. I will easily go with the uh, the iced tea here from uh, from Popeyes. I was just gonna say, all the Bostonians watching right now are shaking their heads because that's all people drink when it is below zero here. You see people, no short kings, short kings with tall drinks uh, walking down Southie. It's like two degrees out and they all have iced coffee. I don't really drink coffee, just on the weekends, but I don't know guys, Panera lemonade slaps in my opinion. Um, I haven't really had the mo majority of these. The Baja Blast, after hearing Jesse say it over and over about the baby, I don't yeah. really know if I can I have it I don't want to Baja Blast this baby. Yeah, yeah so like, I, I don't know if I have the <laughs> appetite for it, but <laughs> we'll see how this goes. You mean associating with one of the nation's premier sodas with the childbirth experience of one of our friends and co-hosts here isn't mm -hmm. super appetizing for you? Yeah. I'm shocked. I'm also shocked. It's very early in the voting that the Baskin Robbins freeze is even getting votes against the might that is Baja Blast. The Baja Blast was so good, Taco Bell decided to make a whole pie out of it in the most recent keynote that yeah. came up because, yes, Taco Bell does a keynote address akin to Apple to launch new products, so... Taco Bell Baja Blast should be the overwhelming favorite in this region. But outside of that, Dad, I think the Starbucks iced coffee is going to have a shot because America might run on Dunkin' in the Northeast, yep. but everywhere yep. else, man, Starbucks is pretty ubiquitous. I, 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 have you ever had iced coffee, Dad? I want to ask that because you've always railed yep. against it, I, and I don't feel like you've ever tried it because most of the things that you don't like, you just have actually never tried or had. No, I've tried it. I tried it once and didn't like it, so I'm not going back to it. Uh, but I, yes, I did try it, because you're right. There are things I say I didn't like that I haven't tried, and that sounds somewhat ridiculous. I should at least try them before I say I don't like them, like most vegetables, which I either haven't tried and never will or have tried and don't like. Uh, but I have tried iced coffee, and I uh, did not like the iced coffee. Gojo, you got to fix this. My you need to get your dad a good, like, sweet iced coffee. If you guys like sweet things, Senior, you will love iced coffee if you get the right one. See, the, the biggest feather in my cap that I have, because dad trying not trying things and saying he doesn't like them isn't just limited to food items and drink items. This is also in his life. My dad, for years, never went to the Super Bowl. This is his whole hang-up. He never went as a player. He never wanted to go as a member of the media. And so for years, decades covering the sport, he would always go out there and cover the Super Bowl during the week, but never actually stay for the game until finally he started doing radio calls for Westwood One, and he got asked to be a part on the sideline of the radio call. And I will never forget the Super Bowl in Los Angeles back in 2022, and my dad calls me from down on the field in SoFi before the game and goes, I'm not going to lie, this is pretty sweet right now. I feel kind of dumb for never having done this before in the entire time that I've been covering this sport. That's surprising though to I'll hear. say, <laughs> Though I will say, if I had to cover it 
like as a media member, like up in the press box or an auxiliary press box, I still don't, I don't think I'd want to do it though. I, and now that I've, well, cause I got spoiled. I'm actually on the broadcast, actually part of the broadcast and actually get to be, you know, on the sideline for it. So by the, by the first time I've actually got to cover them, I got spoiled to actually be involved in it. So I don't think when it, whenever I'm done working with Westwood One, if I'm still in the media and they say, hey, you want to go sit in the press box for the Super Bowl? Mike, I'm probably going to say no because uh, I, I think I did get spoiled being on the sideline or, or even if I was in the booth but actually calling the game. That's, that's some good stuff. I've, I've enjoyed it. It's like dad's first concert experience. Hey, hey, you want to come backstage and then sing with the band for a little bit is essentially how you've jumped into your Super Bowl experience. So all that is to say, I don't know if Ice Coffee has that kind of comeback capability capability in my dad's life, but we can see hope and pray. So at Gojone Golick on Twitter is where you can get started with the voting. Again, all four in our drinks bracket are now up there and able to vote for Baja Blast versus the Baskin Robin Freeze, McDonald's Coke versus Dunkin' Culotta, and now the latest two entries, Sonic Cherry Limeade against the Panera Lemonade, and Starbucks Ice Coffee against Popeye's Cane Ice Tea. Claudia, let's take a look ahead at the games coming up today and get a little cash it or trash it in here. Yeah, cash it or trash it presented by DraftKings. Stay tuned to hear everything DraftKings has to offer throughout the show. DraftKings, the crown is yours. Gambling problems? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Age and eligibility restrictions apply. Void where prohibited. See DraftKings.com for details. You mentioned it, Gojo. Let's look ahead at today's bracket. And Cedar, let's go to you first. Feeling so confident after that uh, yesterday's games. What do we got up next? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think for me, you know, and, and, and listen, th this is all about this is all about the, uh, the the upsets and what we have, right? So I do have a 12 seed. I have Grand Canyon uh, beating St. Mary's today. I have the 11 seed. I have New Mexico beating Clemson uh, as well. So those are two right out of the gate. I'm trying to look at the other. Uh, games out here. Oh, I have I have James Madison beating Wisconsin as well. So those right out of the gate that I'm looking at are are two or three of my upsets for today. So I'm definitely calling for some more some more upsets. Yeah, Dan, I'm in the same boat as you with a lot of those uh, upsets there, especially uh, the 11 seed, uh, New Mexico over Clemson. New Mexico favored in this game on DraftKings Sportsbook. I think they're like a two-and-a-half point favored in this game since 1985. We got this note from our producer, Tom Glennon, before the show. 11 seeds have won 101 games since then, the most of any seed uh, I believe, of the lower seeds in the tournament. So everyone's been saying it. 11 is the new 12. The 12-5 up, upset used to be trendy. If New Mexico pulls this off today, we'll have a clean sweep. All four 11 seeds will have beat all yep. four six seeds in the tournament. And with that being the expectation... It's a very interesting indictment of everything that Greg Sankey wanted to put into the universe in regards to the expansion of the tournament, trying to create room for more of these fringe power five teams that he says are great teams that are being left out as opposed to these single bid leagues. And uh, dad, I, I think for a lot of these smaller schools that we've seen rise up and do their thing in this tournament and show that, hey, this is still the best part of the tournament. As I've gone on, that's one place I've changed my tune. I don't know about you, dad, and what your opinion on this was for years. I always said, yeah, you know what? First round of the NCAA tournament, it's like the opening round of American Idol. We love all the goofy sideshow stuff, and we love to see people yeah, go out yeah. there and do something crazy. And then after that, you want to see quality. All these upsets and Cinderella's give way to some bad later round games, and it ends up making for a worse product. I have changed my tune completely on that. It really is about the upsets at the beginning of the tournament that give way. We'll get plenty of the Blue Bloods that I'm sure will survive into the Final Four, the Sweet 16, all that stuff. But this opening weekend really is the essence of the sport, I think, and we got reminded of that again yesterday. Well, it, it is, and, and you're right. We sit there and like the opening round upsets, but then you kind of not so much want chalk, but you look at blue bloods, you want it the rest of the way. But you're eventually, in the case of North Carolina State and Oakland both getting a win, you're going to get one of those teams matched up potentially against the two seed in Marquette. You know, So you, you wonder how a game like that uh, may go. So you're right. You want to see the upsets now, but then you want to see good games. You don't want to, that, that second weekend, you don't want to start seeing blowouts. You want to see some competitive games where you don't mind that in the first weekend. You get, you get everything. You get blowouts, you get close games, and you get major upsets. But by the second weekend, 
Now, if you have a double-digit seed in there, you'd like to a lot of times like to, especially if your bracket's blown up like Claudia's is, maybe you'd like to see those double digits continue uh, to go on and win and really kind of bust everybody else's brackets up. Thank you, senior. <laughs> yeah, you got it. Really just twisting the knife here this morning. The tension <laughs> is palpable on set. I, I think the thing I'm most looking forward to today in checking out, obviously UConn, the number one overall seed in the tournament, they take on 16 seed sets, and this would be probably the most improbable 16-1 in a sea of – a seeding matchup that hardly ever had upsets before a few years ago when UMBC and others started to make this a thing. I don't think UConn's at risk there, but for UConn, for Houston, for Marquette, for Purdue especially, who's got so many of these postseason hangups, can we see the stretch of top seed dominance continue? Because that was the one thing yesterday, Dad, outside of Kentucky on the three line being a team that went down to Oakland as we've established, the rest of the top seeds dominated in the first round like there wasn't yep. a matchup between a one two or three outside of Kentucky that was even close when it came to the final score most of them by 15 or 20 plus points and so will that continue in today or will we see one of the mightier Goliaths slain especially a team like Houston a little bit offensively challenged tries to overwhelm you by playing physical brand of big 12 defense uh, that's probably what I'm most curious to see because we didn't really get like a buzzer beater moment yesterday the Sanford game and the call at the end right. kind of robbed us of that potential so I think that's the one thing we like to see going into today i think what's what's interesting is a lot of people including you mike have uconn winning at all i have uconn being the first number one out so and that would be next really? weekend i have them obviously beating stetson i have eight nine seed i never look at as an upset if a nine beats an eight but i have florida atlantic beating northwestern so uconn would tip play uh florida atlantic on sunday but then next week, I have the matchup UConn against Auburn because I have Auburn winning the first couple of games. Then I have Auburn upsetting UConn. So I actually have the favorite being the first number one seed out. Now, I don't know if part of that is for my our couple of decades living in Connecticut and working at ESPN and the the how great UConn was and how bad much they didn't like Notre Dame to the point where you and Jake and or Sydney would make sure you wore Notre Dame gear going to school uh, just to throw it in the face of UConn people whenever you could. So I don't know if it's a holdover from that. I don't know if this is a good pick by me at all, but I did it anyway. So, Senior, you like them to get through stats, and let me ask you this. They're 26.5-point favorites at DraftKings. Would you take the points? Do you think Stetson can keep it within 27? I'd probably, I'd probably say go with UConn on that uh, in, in beating okay. that spread. I prob, I probably would. Sorry, Stetson. You know, <laughs> uh, see if we we have seen the sixteen beat the one. It's not going to happen here. But to your point, you know, is it going to be that? Because that that's that's more your line, right? Betting on what's going to happen on in the game and not the bracket sheet since your bracket sheet's so bad. Correct. Yeah, bracket in the trash in case you <laughs> missed that. Um, I I played the team total for UConn, which is something if you're looking for a little betting tip with big favorites. I do this in the NBA a lot of the time with the Celtics, and it works. Going over their team total, of course, those lines are going to be adjusted accordingly, but. Line moved in my favor up to 86 and a half, so sort of chasing it, I guess, sort of speak. But yeah, 85 and a half is where I went instead of sweating out them covering by 27. If they cover by 27, they'll probably score 85 or more. So that's yeah. the way I'm going with it. A little word for the wise there as we head into this day's slate of games. And I think from the We've talked about the tournament star power compared to the women's tournament on the men's side today. And mm -hmm. yesterday, we obviously had stars born, right? And Jack Golke and what happened with Oakland. And some of the guys will get to know in that way. But as far as household names coming into the tournament today, you look at guys that are also going to be high up on draft boards. UConn's Donovan Klingon, the big man from Bristol Central near our hometown dad in Connecticut, who's certainly going to be up there. Zach Eady from Purdue, a, a tournament where bigs are kind right. of the flavor of the day. He's the guy that's going to sweep most of the postseason awards and have all these player of the years and it is going to go down we talked to Jordan Cornette a few weeks ago on here about him if they were to get over the postseason hump this year you're talking about a guy with maybe one of the all-time great college careers that we've ever seen going into this tournament and I think it's sort of interesting to consider that in conjunction with the news that we heard yesterday about the NBA's G League Ignite going away now, citing and saying, hey, name, image, and likeness in the transfer portal and all these new advents in college athletics sort of changed the math on what this was supposed to be, an alternative path for guys who wanted to play basketball, be able to capitalize off their name, image, and likeness and make real professional money. 
while still getting ready for the next level and getting that preparation against professional players. And now, Dad, the current landscape of college basketball gets really interesting with that in mind because you've still got one and dones right now as a rule, so the best players still have to go and offer that year of eligibility in college or elsewhere before they can become draft eligible. But now you're taking away one of those other avenues for talent. And I, I won't say it's this massive gulf here. I think in the top 25 prospects in this year's draft, something like four of them were G League night players i think only two in the top 10 yeah. a lot more of it is guys coming from overseas that are going to be highly right. drafted prospects in this year's draft but i do wonder if that's anything in the world of college basketball now that's kind of in a weird bind in terms of keeping its best players in the sport for long enough to become the kind of household names that affect the tournament kentucky is the perfect example you've got a bunch of really high profile draft prospects and great players on that team but they didn't stick around in the most important month of the season long enough for anyone to really get to know them. And now most of those guys are going to leave for the NBA and we're never going to have that relationship. The best players are going to be gone, right? I mean, after a year anyway. Now, I like I like what the G League, you know, with the Ignite team, what they did. I, giving players an opportunity. And we've seen players take opportunities instead of going to college go to the G League, or go overseas and play and get paid while they're doing it to prepare for the draft. Uh, but now, right, since NIL hit and these guys can make so much money, you know, going to college, I, I, I can see the, the, that G League Ignite team shutting down. I completely understand that. And you're right. Of the top 25 prospects, four were G League, 10 were foreign players. So you have over half of them being anywhere but college at this point. And I don't even know about – becoming the household names because you got basically a year to do it because the best players are going to be gone. And now that, that it's shutting down, so more players will go to college uh, to go for that one and done. But, Mike, I think it's going to change again soon anyway. I think we're going to go back to you don't have to go one and done, that you can go directly from high school like we have seen. And we have seen, guys, obviously you see the success stories and for every success story, you always wonder how many failed stories there are of guys that don't want to go to college at all, that want to go right to the league, that don't make it. And once they go to the league, you know, lose any kind of eligibility for college. So, and if they don't make it, what happens to them? Uh, so I, I think we're eventually heading down that road, going back to the high school seniors going right to the NBA. But for now, this, this was the right move to shut this down because players understand I can go get you know, play some good ball at a blue chip college and make a ton of money before I go to the NBA. Yeah, that all, it makes perfect logistical sense why that would no longer have the same utility they thought of at the beginning here. But you're right in that I don't think it solves much of modern men's college basketball's problems because of that. Now, I do think it's interesting using Kentucky as sort of the, the case study for this as right now we're contemplating John Calipari's future and his future of team building potentially after a loss that was so jarring given the level of prospects. A number one recruiting class full of great three-point shooters that were part of the most exciting offense in college basketball for the majority of this year. And now wondering, can you win like that consistently anymore? Where for years, it was John Calipari got all these future lottery picks to come in, sacrifice a little bit of their shine in the name of playing for this team, where it evened out some of the stats for these great players but ultimately they won. It was a very simple, similar formula to what Alabama did in football for so long. But in football, you get three, leave, three years to let it marinate before you get these guys shipped on out of there if you're doing this on the level that they were supposed to. For Kentucky now, it's been this same deal for a while. And I, I do wonder, it highlights, as we're getting ready to talk about the women's game, Tarika Foster Brasby is going to join us to break down the women's bracket heading into the start of the tournament today, where we see, because the WNBA does not yet have the opening salaries that are a winning lottery ticket for right. these players to go and draw them out of school earlier, you get the best players in the sport staying for the full term of their eligibility in college, by and large, and you get the time to know them. We've got these sensational freshmen that have come in so game-ready now, as opposed to their counterparts, where a lot of times it's looked a little bit more raw. The game has looked a little bit clunkier on the men's side. And so I don't know if this goes a long way in answering or helping that dad, but at the very least, it's something different introduced into the equation. Uh, I, listen, I agree about the women's side that we're going to talk about. Usually you see that great freshman year and you're like, well, we won't see them again, but we're going to see these top uh, freshman women for a, more, a couple of more years, which is great for the sport.
on Gojo and Golik where it's time to talk some women's hoops. And take a look at these one seeds because I don't know who is going to stop any of these faces and these squads up here, Gojo. No, it is an absolute murderer's row of star power and basketball power getting set to tip off this weekend for the women's tournament. And so for more on that, to get us uh, started with the conversation here, delighted to welcome in an old friend from ESPN and someone you've seen covering college basketball, women's basketball, the WNBA at ESPN. You've seen her on CBS before as well. Tarika Foster, Brasby, kind enough to join us now. T, what's going on? What's going on, man? It's been forever. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm basking in the glow of yesterday. I'm sure you, like all of us, were sitting around watching everything that transpired yesterday. Hot start already to the weekend here. I don't know. I, obviously, we want to talk to you about the women's tournament and everything that's getting ready to go on there. But uh, what was the biggest thing that stuck out from you from yesterday as the men's tournament got going? Well, besides the obvious, I, I, I almost had a perfect bracket to start. To Like, here I am. Literally, I was like, whoa, this is great. Duquesne did great for me. I was like, yeah, let's get it. Oregon helped me down. And then, of course, Kentucky does what Kentucky wasn't supposed to do to Oakland University at that, being that I'm from Michigan. So I'm probably one of the only people in the world who actually knows about Oakland University. Um, so, yeah, other than that, like I was feeling really good about my start. So as far as the, the women starting today, we, we know that the women's bracket is normally more chalk heavy than the men's bracket. But still, you know, you love to see some upsets, especially in these first couple of days. Where are you looking at where those possibilities coming up today or tomorrow? Yeah, well, I think the one upset match that people might not be paying good attention to is UNLV and Creighton. I think UNLV is a team that has really flown under the radar to a lot of people. And that's a team that you might want to keep your eye on. Desi Ray Young, she's a, 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 a the impact player for UNLV. She is the star of that UNLV squad. And so I think if you're thinking about Mountain West, if you're thinking about West Coast teams that don't get a lot of shine and don't get a lot of love, UNLV is looking to advance for the first time in the NCAA tournament. And I think this matchup with Creighton gives them that opportunity to do so. All right, well, if we're going to talk about star names here, this tournament has plenty of them. In general, T, I mean, looking at the way that the women's game has now morphed into what everyone sees as the premier tournament in terms of storylines, in terms of household names here, where do you think the turning point was for this? When did all of a sudden we make this shift to where now the women's game is being lauded as the objectively more interesting side? Well, I think there's a couple of things that got us to this point, right? Obviously, the the, the first and foremost thing is Caitlin Clark, right? Caitlin Clark is just a name that resonates with everyone. Everyone has been able to see how she's been able to transform the viewership um, most recently as it relates to people just wanting to see star power, wanting to see um, an entertaining player. So I give Caitlin the, the utmost um, recognition for what she has been able to do in that regard, right? Um, she, you know, she isn't the first person um, at Iowa to to have a, a quote unquote a name, but she is absolutely the first person at Iowa to take it to this level, and it is exciting to see. She's a record breaker. She's a star. So obviously, Caitlin Clark is someone that has helped to propel the viewership. Um, but I also think in in tying it into the men's game, I also think it's longevity, and I think it's the ability to grow, right? One thing that you can see in the women's game, because they don't have the ability to come out in a year or two, is that they literally get to grow and learn and become a part of the fans, a, a part of their household. They become a, a part of, of their everyday interest. They want to know. They get to know these girls, right? So the fan and the viewership, we've seen these girls since they were freshmen. Now they're seniors and they're doing amazing things. On the men's side, you don't get to build that relationship anymore because the men are gone a year. Like, I'm a Michigan State fan, guys, and I have no idea at the beginning of each year who the hell is on the team. I always have to, like, look at the roster to say, okay, so who who's the, who's the starting five this year? In women's basketball, you already know. They've already built that relationship, and I think that goes a large part. Well, listen, there are so many individuals that we name in women's college basketball over the men. It's, it's amazing right now. They have the shine 
right now. But then you sit there and talk team, and it's Dawn Staley, South Carolina Gamecocks. I mean, they're unbelievable uh, right now. Again, Camilla Cardoso, the six seven center, is going to miss this game. Uh, nobody mess with her. She will knock you down. Hopefully she won't do that in the tournament and cost herself any more games. So I ask you this, and I ask this completely biased, as Mike would, would attest to, as Notre Dame grads, how do you beat South Carolina? And I ask this for the potential Notre Dame-South Carolina matchup uh, in the Elite Eight for a, an injury-depleted Notre Dame team. Here's the here, here's the sad part. You don't beat South Carolina. South Carolina <laughs> beats South Carolina. <laughs> like, you don't beat South Carolina. This team is so good. And for so many different reasons, guys, like it's they're adaptable, right? It doesn't matter what you throw at them. It doesn't matter, um, you know, what style of basketball the opponent plays. They have the ability to adapt, and that makes them so good and so different. Um, you also can add to that that they are incredibly well coached. Dawn Staley has done it quite literally at every single level. She knows what she's doing. She knows how to inspire her players, which is something a lot of coaches wish they had the ability to do. I've often joked and called her the Nick Saban of women's basketball because I said it doesn't matter mm -hmm. that you graduate all five of your starters you just got a whole new championship lineup right behind you like that's the Alabama way so it's it, it's awesome um to see that she continues to just raise stars and raise women to play this game at the highest level on a collegiate level as it relates to Notre Dame guys you know I hate to <laughs> I hate to be the but let's just say that Notre Dame basketball is really at a great place. Um, you guys got a freshman, Hannah Hidalgo, who was amazing. Sonia Citron is still there doing great things. It's just the injury bug that has really gotten to this Notre Dame team. Still no Olivia Miles. Now Kylie Watson has an ACL injury. Like those are the things that are just being the thorn in this Notre Dame team side. But, you know, at the end of the day, you guys still have an opportunity to go on a great run. And I think I've got you guys in my bracket. I think I've got Notre Dame up going to the Sweet 16 at least. Yep, we're all realizing in South Bend we're building towards next year when we get Olivia back and can really form <laughs> yep. this thing up like yep. Voltron. But uh, in the meantime, we've talked about Iowa. We've talked about South Carolina. I think it's interesting, T, that, and we've only got a couple minutes left here, but the, the reigning national champion in LSU seems to be getting talked about a lot less for a team that brought back Angel Reese and added Haley Van Lith and still has Kim Mulkey there as the head coach. What's been the difference from last year's title team to this year? I actually think this team is better. This team is more focused. Mm. Um, this this team has a mission. They understand what it's mean to be the hunted and not the hunter this year. And they're really in good position. I've heard some people complaining about them being a three seed, but they were a three seed last year when they won the championship, right? So uh, the, the seeding does not matter for them. What does matter for them is that they are in the gauntlet region. There's Iowa, UCLA, um, LSU, Colorado, which is a very good team that people might have forgotten about. Can Kansas State, like they are in the gauntlet of regions, and that is what's going to haunt them. It's going to haunt Iowa. It's going to really put them up to the test. But I think this LSU team has a really great chance of repeating, um, it, repeating, getting to the national championship. Let me clarify what I mean by repeat. Um, I think they have a great chance of getting back. I actually, you know, without telling too much, but it's out there now. Um, at, LSU and South Carolina are my are my championship. Uh, that's my championship matchup. So um, I think if, if I'm Kim Mulkey's team, I want people to continue to sleep on me and not talk about me because that takes the pressure off of what we have to do, especially in such a tough region. Uh, there we go. All right. So a little bit of SEC uh, championship rematch for the folks in the NCAA tournament here, the way T's got it shaken out. T, thank you so much for the time this morning. It was so great to catch up with you. Been too long. We got to do this more often, especially as we get into the summer when everything starts kicking up with the W here. Thank you so much. At She Knows Sports is where you can catch her on Twitter. A phenomenal job covering all things college basketball, the WNBA, and more. Thanks, T. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Rika Foster Brasby again Exciting kind enough today. to join us here and yep. get us ready. Set. That's that's interesting, Dad, because I feel like LSU has yep. kind of been on the back burner conversationally amongst a lot of the discussion this year. Yeah, w w again with the tournament that holds more chalk, she has LSU in the title game. That means she eventually has them if if it holds a bit, beating uh, Iowa and Caitlin Clark in that in that rematch there. So I'm sure everybody's pointing toward that.
Oh, and I'm sure everyone is praying to any god who will listen that we get a rematch of all the hand-waving that went on in that champ matchup last year. All right, guys, every once in a while, preparation meets opportunity, and we get to do what I think is the most universally loved segment, at least by our own staff on the show, uh, and it's time for another rousing edition of Senior versus the Internet today. Uh, my father, Michael Bullock Sr., in digital form, <laughs> warring against the trappings of the Internet, confused by everything that he sees online. I always say, if you're going to watch on DraftKings Network, if you're going to watch anywhere on YouTube, it's always worth it for that graphic to flash there. Seeing my dad work through Super Mario 3 is something I never thought I'd get to see in my life, but we're here now, and that's the case for most of the things my dad sees online. How it works, if you're new here, we find videos on the internet, and we show them to my father, who doesn't really spend much time on the internet, and... uh we kind of see what happens after that, and I feel really good about where we're going to go with this first one because it's going to hit on one of the things that confuses my dad the most in this world, and that is influencers. Influencers in the wild. And in these videos, we've got an influencer dancing on top of the luggage carousel on a top of a luxury car and actually shattering the windshield in the process. So let's get to take a look in this video, and then we'll explain in the aftermath, Dad, who exactly this is and what's going on. So, All right, so yeah, she's, so she's, where, yeah, where, where you go get your luggage and what they tell little kids not to do, don't sit on the luggage, uh, you know, where you get your luggage. She's dancing on it. Then she runs up on a sports car, cracks a windshield. She's on the hood dancing. <laughs> I don't understand it. Not one bit. They tell children not to go on the baggage claim. And here's an, an adult girl. I don't know how old she is dancing on plus, there yeah. and and she's called an influencer to which ah. after our show yesterday i asked 
what the hell is she influencing? When I think of influencer, I think of you're doing something to influence or promote something, a product or something. She is dancing on a car and dancing on the bag in the baggage claim carousel. What the hell is she influencing? Well, um, yeah, so this led to a conversation yesterday where I had tears in my eyes because I had to explain to Senior. It's OnlyFans. That's what people say, that she has an OnlyFans, which is why I said 18 plus. I believe she is 18 plus because if she has an OnlyFans, okay. which is where you okay. promote things. Right. Yeah. So yeah. that's the point, though, because she's doing things that you're not supposed to do, not wearing much clothes. So, of course, it leads to people like us. We talk about sports for a living, yet here we are talking about this half-naked girl doing things absurdly and cracking the windshield of cars, which people say maybe it's her well, car. And basically, she's doing it to get us to talk about her. And then that leads to the conversation of what she sells. And apparently, that's what it is. So... Well, well I, at again, least in the what conversation is she trying what to explain I, I, OnlyFans to my father, which is a real like for anyone well, that watched the, inside the NBA crew try and explain social media to Charles Barkley and Shaq trying to bait him into signing up for an OnlyFans. That's the conversation we had to have with Dad yesterday, and I still don't think he fully understands so, the concept of OnlyFans. So, and quite honestly, that makes me happier than most things in this life. Okay, so I, I obviously will never be on on OnlyFans. No, I, I, it, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong. On OnlyFans, it's not like you're selling, it's not like she's influencing to go on OnlyFans because she's pushing a product. The product, for lack of a better term, is her, correct? Yes. So the term influencer is ridiculous because she's influencing nothing. And now let well, me say this. <laughs> well, I, okay. Then, then this leads me to my next, my next thing. Everybody, you know, way back in the day wanted to rip on the Kardashians uh, for, for what they did. And you're like, oh, my God, what are they doing? But, you know, kudos to them. And at the end of the day, now, if it wasn't this young lady's sports car that she ran up on, she damn well better be footing the bill uh, for cracking the windshield and denting the, the, the roof and everything uh, th that she was doing. Now, I don't know if it's her car or not, but I'll say this. While I certainly wonder what the hell she's doing and she's making a living doing this, but from what I understand and what you guys have told me, that they can make pretty good money doing this. So in all reality, while I look at her and I'm like, what in God's green earth is she doing and what the hell is she influencing? More power to her at the end of the day when you get the amount of friggin' and I'll call them losers to go on OnlyFans and give her a ton of money for doing that. Who's the winner and who's the loser here? I mean, seriously. Well, Dad, that's why I want to explore something with you because uh, you mentioned you would never be on OnlyFans. And obviously, as a consumer, I hope that remains the case because those aren't waters you want to wade in. But... <laughs> As a content creator, listen, we have to address the elephant in the room that post-pandemic, there have been a lot of people thirsting for you online. There have been a lot of people calling you a zaddy. People have sexualized you in a way that makes me really uncomfortable. But if we were to weaponize that discomfort that I experience into creating an OnlyFans page for you where you love taking baths and watching videos in your bathtub, you watch your TV shows in there, we just set up a little camera, nothing shows of you there. It's just the top of your head in the bathtub, and we just put that on there. I got to imagine there's decent change out there for that. There's probably a market for this, these weird sickos, and maybe this could be your retirement fund and we can tap into that. You're being how, solicited uh, by your son, senior. How, uh, how much money are we talking here? <laughs> I, I, the figures that I have heard are, are pretty staggering. So I, I think we need to at least explore it. Obviously, I'm going to get a percentage of this because it was my idea. So <laughs> think of me as sort of like your pimp in this well, situation where you've got to give me a cut in all this. We need to so run a I, poll. I guess. <laughs> See how much people I, I guess when I say, when I say, hun, can you draw? We taking a bath soon, you know, takes on a whole different meaning. Huh? When, uh, when, when your mother takes a bath and then I go in her bath water. Will that add? <laughs> do you think that will add to the price that people will pay 
that I use her bath water. She takes a bath, she gets out, and I go into her bath water. Do you think there will be people, sickos out there that are going, oh, yeah, he's going into dirty bath water. I'll give another dollar or whatever the hell it is. <laughs> okay. I mean, is this, All right. is this I where we're going? Every, I regret every second of this. <laughs> I've made such a mistake now. What happened? I, I mean, I, I really didn't what? know he was going to take it there. I should have seen should, this coming. Should I... I should I, should I, if I'm in the bathtub, should I start to get out of the bathtub? <laughs> and then as I'm getting out of the bathtub, we cut away real quick and just give like a little glimpse. You know what I'm talking about? To kind of up the price. Is that what we do? Can I seductively get out of the bathtub? Should I have your, your mother there waiting with a towel? And then you just see the towel up and me walk into the towel with some of me showing and some of me not showing, is that the role we're going to go? Is that what we're going to do? Because I'll damn well do it if it's going to make the money that this young lady and these other influencers are making. And you know what? I'm hopping on the friggin' train is what I'm going to do. Or I'm hopping in the friggin' tub is what I'm going to do. Yeah. Bring it on. The internet was a mistake. Coach, this segment this is, was a mistake. This is your fault. I, I, yeah, I get it. will be nude in the bathtub. <laughs> Yes, I will. Well, go ahead and think what you want. I can't. Man. I'm leaving you, now. You, I'm done with this. Let me, so, <laughs> so let me ask a question. This is a, a legitimate question. So oh. let, let's, just, let's just go down this stupid road. So, and I, cause I have no idea how, how OnlyFans work. If I, <laughs> if I were to be <laughs> bathtub daddy, <laughs> No, 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 why? If I were to be that no. daddy, do, do, I, do I set the price or do people just throw money at me like I'm, you know, the thunder from down under doing a dance, you know, at a strip joint or is there an actual come look at, you know, daddy, you know, daddy in the tub or whatever the hell I just said and you have to pay a certain amount or is it anything people want to spend? How does that work? How does that work? Daddy in the tub. I think it's technically <laughs> subscribers, but they can also send you gifts, and there might be a little bit more money if you get in the private chat with them, but then Sydney's going to have to run the private chat because you don't have the technical let wherewithal me, to do that, especially from the bathtub, and let, making Sydney do that seems especially let cruel. Me, let me just say, if I'm in the bathtub and somebody's paying to watch that, I don't want the money that jingles. I want the money that folds. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Tub Daddy.
Welcome back to Gojo and Gold. It's time to finish off this show. Mer- we're putting this show down is what we're doing. We're mercy killing this show today. <laughs> As always, make sure you download, subscribe, rate, review. Leave us. I, I don't even know if we deserve a five-star rating after what we put through people through today with only dads or tub daddy or whatever the hell we came up with here in the last segment. But hey. leave us a five-star rating. Check us out live Monday through Friday from 8 to 10 a.m. Eastern on the DraftKings Network, our YouTube channel, Samsung TV+, Plus, Roku, and more. Make sure you catch the best of Gojo and Gold from noon to 1 p.m. Eastern wherever you hear VEASAN on the radio. And if you missed any of our great guests today, and thank you to Oakland men's basketball head coach Greg Campy, who joined us coming off their big win over Kentucky last night to talk about the anatomy of an upset in March Madness. We also had Tarika Foster Brasby join us to preview the women's tournament today at Shino Sports on Twitter is where you can find her uh, as we now get into this, that, and the third to mercifully palate cleanse us after my father. my, my I have a no. text from my poor mother that said, why did you do that? Coming <laughs> hey, off a of last segment hey. where we introduced the concept of my father's OnlyFans to him. Yeah. <clears throat> Daddy in the tub or whatever the hell I called it. But listen, Mike, this is, I've shown skin before publicly. I, it's not like this is a for. How do you yeah. think... The, the old picture of, of me uh, uh, reenacting the Kim Kardashian pose, how would that have done in OnlyFans if OnlyFans was going on then, that picture? What do we think then? Honestly, you blamed the Kardashians for modern influencer culture, but really the Golic butt photo from a famed March Madness bracket <laughs> tournament wager loss to Mike Greenberg back in the day probably launched all of this right now, as I'll never forget the horror of coming home and seeing a paint roller and a bo- bottle of baby oil on the counter of my childhood house and watching my mom have to help lather my dad up in a garbage bag so he could take this picture. Yeah, that was... Uh... Yeah, that was your mother. Your mother oiled me up with a paint roller. And then Claudia, Mike had to actually take the pictures. I subjected my son, Mike, to taking pictures of me all oiled up with a with a bow on my buttocks. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, and the pearls <laughs> yep. and all. It's, and now my it's therapist impressive. gets a couple hundred dollars a week to sit and talk to me on Zoom. <laughs> so that's great for her and bad for me. Let's get to this, that, and the third, guys, and talk about something that has nothing to do with my dad's naked figure. Jameis Winston. Uh, his introductory press conference with the Cleveland Browns, including an incredible image of Jameis Winston going into the Browns' weight room to take snaps, fully clothed, wearing a coat from his press conference here. Look at this beauty. What? 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 Well, he's going the opposite of senior here. He went fully clothed. <laughs> I... I- why wouldn't he at least take the jacket off? I don't understand why, how he left that on. His ball is life, Dad. And because fashion takes no breaks, even on the football field, you look good, you play good, you play good, they pay good. And, uh, yeah, now Jameis Winston uh, coming in here. And this, I, Listen, I think the coat's a nice touch, and it's a nice coat. I'm going to look up and see where he got that. I probably can't afford it, but still. <laughs> you, you know what's amazing, Mike, is you played the center position. This is just the two of them doing this in the workout facility. It looks like the center that is making a call. He's actually pointing with his left hand. It's like he's making a call. There's no one there. What the hell are you doing? It's the coolest thing. That, it's the only cool thing you get to do as a center is kneel down and point out the mic. It's the only time you get cool action shots of yourself. <laughs> the rest of your life is discomfort, a jersey that's a little bit too tight. God forbid it's the road whites because then everybody looks fat no matter what. It's the only fun, cool thing that you di- do get to do here. And so this is, by the way, very interesting for the Browns because we saw Deshaun Watson obviously not do great the last couple of years. We saw Joe Flacco lead him to the promised land, and now they've got another prominent quarterback who's made plenty of ways as a backup, most recently helped the New Orleans Saints score that controversial touchdown and seems universally loved by most teammates, probably not the ideal backup for Deshaun Watson for his job security, given the way that he's played. So fascinated to watch that scenario unfold for Cleveland. Claudia, let's get to that here. Very interesting oddity in the world of baseball. Yeah, because if you thought dribbling with your left hand in basketball was cool, sit down because we have an ambidextrous pitcher, which we have seen switch pitchers before, but... This guy's throwing 90-plus with both arms. Durangelo Sanja is a Mississippi State true freshman. He was supposed to sign with the Brewers in the 18th round of the draft last year, but he decided to stay in college, so now he's just mowing down dudes. It is incredible to watch what he's able to do. Did it at a young age as well. I was looking at videos. It's crazy. 90-plus from both arms. I mean, 97 righty and 92 lefty? I mean, that's... That's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. 
That I, I that is just amazing to watch. Yeah, I think this is infinitely. I mean, somehow more impressive than even switch hitting, which always baffled me as someone who can barely yeah. swing with my dominant arm and swing the white ray that way. The thought of having to reverse that order is it's funny. I heard um. LeBron James and J.J. Redick on their uh, Mind the Game podcast, LeBron was talking about one of his best strengths as a basketball player was his ability to mentally flip plays. And he said, you'd be surprised, there's a lot of guys even in the NBA that struggle with having to go and turn things around in their head and go from the other side. Dad, I liken this to even being an offensive lineman, having to work on both sides. People always right. talk about guys <laughs> moving from one side to the other, inside to out, and how all of the differences in your mechanics and the way that you've got to think about it all of a sudden changes, and it's really difficult, even as someone that had to work along all three interior spots the way I did, to try and reverse everything in your head and where you put your weight and how you're stepping on any given play. Now do that with the mechanics of something like pitching, and to be able to do that accurately and with that kind of force is insane. Like phys John Calipari coined this term, insane physical genius out of someone in his position. The mechanics you need to do that, that's almost as impressive as anything else where you can dribble right, dribble left, bat right, bat left, right hand stance, left hand stance, all can be issues and that you have to work on. This, I think, is the by the mechanics of your whole body involved, I would think has to be the toughest thing to do. It, 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 that just absolutely blows my mind. I can't wait to keep following this kid. So you know what it makes me think of? It's obviously Patrick Mahomes has plenty of ties in with baseball. Obviously, his dad was a former league, major right. leaguer. He grew up playing baseball. And we've seen Mahomes at times when he has to bail himself out on a play, go and throw it left-handed. We know their penchant for trick plays, especially down in the red zone. This feels like Mahomes is going to see this, and the competitor in him is going to say, he's got to throw a left-handed touchdown in the red zone this year, right? <laughs> like a tried-and-true yeah. drop-back yeah. lefty. Yep. Trying, you know, I, I think that's what this ultimately leads to here is this kind of influence finding its way into the Chiefs locker room. So just put a bow in it when it happens. Remember who told you it was coming down the pipeline here. <laughs> Claudia, let's get to the third. Something else coming down the pipeline that you and dad are very excited about. Killian Murphy officially signing on for the Peaky Blinders movie. Yeah, so we knew that a movie was coming, but we weren't sure if Murphy was going to star in it. He is. They don't know how much he will be a part of it, but also think about Peaky Blinders. Could they even have a movie without him? I don't necessarily yeah. think so. It's expected to come out late 2025, 2026. No official cast listed, but the core is expected to return. I mean, I watched the series a while ago. I would definitely watch it again, so I'm pumped to watch the movie senior. I love the series, loved the series, thought it was great. And right, you would need him back in the movie. But it, it, it's like I enjoy a series because it can go, like this one for 36 episodes from 2013 to 2022. So, you know, you, you got to ride along for a while. A movie just seems like you have to just condense it and I'm not mm. getting enough out of it, just in my opinion. Like they did this with Ray Donovan. Ray Donovan is a series that I watched and I loved, and they made a Ray Donovan movie, which it just went too quick through the storylines that I was used to it kind of being elongated with a series. So I'll probably watch it anyway, but I'm, I'm not as like into the series, especially series that last for a number of seasons, all of a sudden becoming a, a movie. Mm -hmm. And if anyone's got experience with this, Lord knows it's my father who's watched every television show ever made, has seen all the movies associated with it, and again, has done usually most of this from the comfort of his bathtub. <laughs> Put a bow yes. on it. <laughs> How much does that add to the price if I'm watching something while in the bathtub? Does that add to it? Do I bring uh, my see, knees up and now we're talking about potential copyright knee? infringement in here. I don't know if we've got the rights to all those things now, and so you might open us up to some legal issues here, and as your, your uh, OnlyFans pimp, I do need to keep those things in mind and rein you back in when you get a little too excited over there, big fella. So uh, if you, anyone listening to this, has gotten excited thinking about the prospect of all this, <laughs> make sure you download, subscribe, rate, review this podcast, the only source for Mike Golick Sr.-related zaddy materials. Thanks so much. Have a great weekend. Enjoy March Madness. Vote in Starch Madness at Gojo and Golick. We'll talk to you on Monday.